So one of the places that I'm stopping on the road trip that I'm currently on is Nashville, AKA Music City, because of the number of record producers and record companies that are here. Uh, it's also considered the home of modern country music um, and has been instrumental in some way in launching or helping the careers of no shortage of very, very famous people. Elvis, Taylor Swift, Roy Orbison, Miley Cyrus, the Black Keys, they've all come through or come from Nashville and they've probably come through the neighborhood that I'm walking through right now, Music Row. So since I'm here in the birthplace of modern country, I thought it might be fun to talk about country, a little bit of its history, but also the crazy sort of musical melting pot that exists and how country is related to genres that we might not ever normally associate with it. So recently I was in an Uber and it had the thing where you can use your phone to play music through the stereo and I asked the driver what he thought about it and he said that he loved it because it exposes him to music that he would never normally listen to. And I asked, like, there must be people who want to listen to terrible music and he scolded me and said, there's no such thing as terrible music. And then he thought for a second and he said, except country music. Nobody ever wants to listen to country music. And I mean, for the record, I really like country music. Like, Toby Keith is not really for me, but uh, Gillian Welch, Daniel Romano, um, Sergil Simpson, I really like them. So I, I think it's probably important to note up front while we're talking about these kinds of things that country music, like most music genres, is not an uncomplicated monolith. There's a lot going on. And also, I don't think it's totally fair to say that no one wants to listen to country music. It was the third highest selling genre by records in 2014. It was the second most listened to rush hour radio genre in 2009. Um, I've seen stats claiming that upwards of 75% of radio listeners and 20% of Americans in general regularly listen to country. But still, I will agree that it seems like it makes sense to say no one listens to country music. And I asked my Uber driver about this, why he thought it might be. And he said, because it is so sad. And I think that the sadness has something to do with it, but I don't think it's the whole story. I think people feel okay being polemical about country music because of its relationship to American politics. There have been musicians that have made it really political. They shouldn't stand for the whole genre. However, I totally understand the fact that they do. I just, I wish it wasn't the case. But yes, historically, country music has been sad. It has been about the trials and tribulations of the people singing it or the people they want to identify with. Writer Robert Lacey wrote about that first group of country music listeners and fans way back when, saying that they couldn't tell you with any certainty who was running the show, just that it wasn't they. They drove the trucks, worked the sawmills and turpentine plants. When you get down on the bottom of life, looking up, it can look confusing. Everything begins to seem like a trick. Maybe that's why their music cried out for honesty, faithfulness, and the like. And so, in one sense, especially when it comes to what would be called that high, lonesome sound, I am a man of conscience sorrow. Country music is an honest lamentation for a group of people who feel adrift in the world, but in another sense, it might also have been a big fat joke. In his paper, Resistance and Relief, Ian Ellis writes about how, while folk music tended to directly confront its oppressors, country music tended to focus on the self, the identity of the person singing the song, and therefore the people like the person singing the song. He explains that constant lamentations over lost lovers, pickup trucks, and a world gone mad are self-deprecating narrative tales of fatalistic resignation. Country Western humor, he writes, is loser humor, the humble reflections of the victim. But okay, to a certain degree, that was then, and this is now, that sad, twangy country sound is found less and less on country music radio and even the country charts. And as you might suspect, economics has something to do with the reason why. The commercialization of country music begins with the Grand Ole Opry here in Nashville, which is a live and radio show founded by an insurance company to sell policies. All right, in Nashville, Tennessee, in time for another big half hour of Grand Ole Opry live here on the Nashville Network. Uh, not long after that started, the CMA, or Country Music Association, was founded to 
institutionalized that commercialization and sales aspect of country music, and they decided that in order to help that process along, it would be best if country music distanced itself from its hillbilly connotations, because that's hard to sell. And so over time, um, its sound changed to what we would now describe as the Nashville sound, with fewer banjos and mandolins, less twang, uh, more guitars, more sounding like pop records, uh, less wailing and more crooning. And so it was in this neighborhood over the last 60 to 70 years that that transition and that sound was developed. Talking about girls, talking about trucks, running them red dirt roads out, kicking up This dust. leads to two really familiar paradoxes. First, Johnny Cash and artists like him who cut this figure of rugged, down-to-earth, Uber famous megastars, and people like Taylor Swift, whose transition to pop is confounding to say the least. Like, to what degree was Taylor not pop at the point she crossed over? Importantly, though, I think we need to realize that these things are not endemic to country music, but to the music industry as a whole. It's just that country music provides a great specific case study for the modern commercialization of culture. Country music, like so many other musics, is sold on a kind of authenticity, but importantly, in the process of the selling, important questions get raised about that authenticity and the people making claims to it. Robert Lacey, writing about country music again, said that the music of the underclass had finally arrived, but in the process, it had disappeared, having been swallowed up by the great autonomic mulching machine that is American consumer culture. This country has a genius for that, of course. It can co-opt a counter-trend quicker than you can say Whole Earth Catalog, Volkswagen Beetle, or Granola Bar, which is a thing I had absolutely no idea was a counterculture trend, and is frankly shocking. Made with 100% natural ingredients. Not all granola bars are. I'm gonna have to just stew on that for a while. Lacey's writing about country music, but he could just as easily be writing about hip-hop's transition from Bronx street parties to massive, rise by coastal industries. He could be writing about punk rock's slow subsumption into the alternative music sphere. Anything where a group of people's hopes or frustrations with the world are turned into music and then that is coerced into a massive commercial entity. Which I'm not necessarily saying is bad, especially if we're talking about access, but I think the big questions we always end up asking in these situations is if the future changes the meaning of the past. If bands like Blink-182 change the meaning of the Ramones or television or a thousand other punk bands that I've never heard of because they never played a show anywhere other than some random basement somewhere, does the existence of Dwight Yoakam change the meaning of country music that existed in the hills of Appalachia a hundred years ago? And second, does any of this music lose claim to its intended meaning based upon how it's made? We talked a little bit about this in the Lego Movie episode, but for some reason in music it seems like such a um, specific question. Uh, like, do songs about the simplicity of country living change after you sort of know more about the history of country music and where and how it's made? I don't know. What do you guys think? Let me know in the comments. And thank you so much for taking a stroll around Music Row with me. Now, if you'll excuse me, it's around lunchtime, so I have to go and eat all of the hot chicken. I will see you guys back in New York. I just drove in from Nashville, and boy, are my, this joke doesn't really work. Let's see what you guys had to say about road trips. First things first, I'm gonna be in Phoenix for Comic-Con on the 29th through the 31st, so I'm gonna be wandering around. We're doing a, an office hours on Friday night, and we're doing a panel on Saturday, so we'll put information on where and when those things are happening in the doobly-doo. I hope to see you. I'm so excited. Okay, so on to comments. Um, on the subreddit, nuke the whales again. And Tim Peck talk about how something, uh, a drive becomes a road trip when you have quality time with a passenger. And this, I can totally see this, but I have definitely gone on, on road trips by myself where I have driven a long distance from point A to point B, stopped along the way, felt like I was passing through, but there was no person in the passenger seat with me. So I'd be, I'd be really curious to know what other people think about this, whether or not there's a requirement that you have a passenger uh, or a navigator or someone else with you. So much of the drive that we took was piloted by Google telling us where to go, and we had to decide to take the scenic route or to go out of our way to find things to look at. And I think, if anything, the road trip as defined by going out of one's way 
day might actually come to an end, not because of technology, but because of the diminishing economic returns of making something like a roadside attraction. Uh, that all of the roadside attractions that we saw on our trip were definitely in a state of disrepair. None of them were new. There was nothing that seemed to be built recently. And so I wonder if that is more what will spell the end of what we might describe as a classic road trip than, say, you know, AI. Friend of the show, Joe Hansen from It's Okay To Be Smart talks about how, though he agrees with the idea of passing through, he's not necessarily on board with this idea of the highway taking you through places and says that to a significant degree it actually does take you around them. And I would say that if you are relying solely on the infrastructure, the signs, to take you to places that are off the beaten trail, you might be missing a lot of things, but that, um, and this is something we should have talked about in the episode actually, the combination of high-speed roads and things like Foursquare, Google Maps, Atlas Obscura, and other collections of interest that exist on the internet work as a really great uh, team. And that was how we managed to see a lot of the really interesting stuff that we saw was by traveling quickly from place to place, but every once in a while checking in with the, the sort of local geography about what of interest was around us. And those two things, I think, work really well in concert. Alana D talks about how another reason for the popularity of road trips in America has to do with the fact that we have no high-speed rail system, which is a regrettable truth. Drew Goffin, whose last name I hope I am pronouncing correctly, sees uh, the last week's episode as another example of American exceptionalism. And I think it's worth pointing out that after we were finished shooting the episode in the car, Molly turned to me and said, actually, it's characteristically American for Americans to claim ownership over something like the road trip. And I, I just want to be clear that I'm not saying that the road trip is uniquely American or that we own it, only that for many people there is a strong association between the United States and road trips, and there's got to be a reason for that. I know, it, I know it's not ours. The first one was German. Speaking of which, there were comments from people all around the world talking about the way they see their home country relating to road trips. Comments from Talia Enright, Sophie Rose, Christian H. So we'll put links uh, to those in the doobie-doo. They're really, really great. Two Geek for Names and everybody else who was concerned about my safety, I wanna let you know that we took all of the necessary safety precautions when shooting the episode. I did not do anything dangerous or out of the ordinary. I do sometimes drive with one hand, which you are not supposed to do but I am a very safe driver. I promise. This week's episode was brought to you by the hard work of these rugged, down-to-earth, uber-famous megastars. We have a Facebook, an IRC, and a subreddit links in the doobly-doo. And the tweet of the week comes from Lonasta Feliz, who made Idea Channel cross-stitch purple shirt and everything. Oh my god, it's so good. And hey, in case you were wondering, this episode of Idea Channel was brought to you by Squarespace. Squarespace is an easy way to create a website, blog, or online store for you and your ideas, Squarespace features a user-friendly interface, custom templates, and 24-7 customer support. To try Squarespace, go to squarespace.com forward slash idea channel for a special offer. Squarespace, build it beautiful.